Amen, amen. Well, you got a Bible with you? Say yes. And uh, let me get you to open it to Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. If you're a guest of ours, welcome. We are going through Mark's Gospel in a series entitled Resolved. We put together a devotional book for you. If you've not received one of those, you can go on our website and pick one up. Or you can go on Amazon Kindle and actually get the digital uh, style book. And that's absolutely free today. So we'd love and encourage you to do that. It's just called Resolve 31 Resolutions of a Disciple's Life. So you grab hold of it. But this morning we find ourselves really in Mark's Gospel chapter 2. But before we stand and read it, let me just uh, kind of kick it off like this. You know, whenever you and I are trying to describe something in life that's going to be real simple, we usually use uh, some phrases that are pretty common. So we say stuff like this. We say... Uh, it would be a walk in the park. You ever said that before, right? Or maybe we say, uh, it, that's going to be a piece of cake, uh, which, by the way, I like it like this. That's going to be a piece of 12-layered chocolate cake. Y'all with me with some milk on the side? All right, God bless you guys. All right, so, and then sometimes we even say, that's going to be easy peasy. Have you ever used that phrase before? I use that one a lot as well. But whenever it comes to the Christian life, if you're a new convert and you've just started following Jesus and you think that following Jesus is going to be a walk in the park, a piece of cake, or easy peasy. You're going to be sorely disillusioned because that's just not the case. We are in a journey with Jesus, and the journey is not easy. We are walking against the mainstream way of thinking and living. And not only are we walking against culture, but we're also walking against how our hearts are even wired. The Bible says our hearts are desperately wicked above all things, and our hearts are not naturally bent toward heaven. So now that as the Lord begins to work in our lives, we find that it is a struggle, that it is very difficult to follow the Lord. But it's a journey, and all of us are on it. It begins, first of all, with a faith decision in Jesus. The Bible says God created us to know him. And hey, by the way, this is good news right here, all right? Uh, God created you to know him, but what separates you is sin. And all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. And the wages of our sin is death. So if we hold on to our sin, we die and we go to hell. But God doesn't desire that. God is not willing that any would perish, but all would come to everlasting life. And so God sent his son Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross at Calvary for our sin. He was buried and raised again. And whenever you turn from your sin and place your trust in Jesus, that is a decision of faith. You are trusting that Jesus' death on the cross paid for your sin, and you're believing in his resurrection. Whenever you make that decision, you have entered into what we call the faith. It's a faith decision that got you there, but that's not where it stops. All right? The journey continues. Matter of fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we walk by faith. All right, so check it out. We enter in by faith, and now we walk by faith. So we walk every single day of our lives learning how to trust in the Lord, full dependence upon Him. And there is a promise from the Lord. The Lord promises that to everyone whom He has called. Scripture says He is going to conform us into the image of His Son. In fact, Paul writes it like this in Romans 8 and 29. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. So whenever you came to faith, God took you up out of darkness, put you in light, but he also put you upon his potter's will, and he now is shaping you and changing your way of thinking and your way of living so that you reflect the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. The Bible promises that ultimately we will actually experience glorification as followers of Christ. That is, we will be given brand new bodies. Never, ever again will we have to worry about sin. But it's a process. We're headed in that direction. And I love what C.S. Lewis uh, says about uh, believers who are being conformed to the image of Christ. Let me give you this quote. He says it like this. Every human being is in the process of becoming a noble being. Now, he's talking about followers of Jesus here. He says, noble beyond imagination, the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would strongly be tempted to worship. See, God is so going to change us that we are going to reflect his glory in an all, I don't even understand how it's all going to go down, but it is going to be awesome. Can I get a witness on that one, right? It's going to be great stuff how the Lord transforms and changes our life. So that's God's promise. Now, that leads me to kind of kick it in and say this. God has a plan for your life. So God doesn't bring you into the faith and then just kind of say, welcome and then leave. All right, God brings you into the faith and now he actually has a plan for you to accomplish. Now you think about this. Um, whenever you receive God's plan for your life, it is a massive step, once again, of faith to trust the Lord, to obey him, to do what he's called you to do. 
Matter of fact, think about these individuals who received God's plan for their life and ask yourself the question, uh, did it require any faith? Uh, God's plan for Noah uh, was to build a floating zoo. Are y'all with me on that one? Right? Do you think that took faith? Without a doubt. And then think about Abraham. God made a plan with Abraham and said, I'm going to uh, make you the father of a huge nation. And yet Abraham was an old man. His wife was old as well. And they didn't even have a son. So what did they have to do? They had to have faith that the Lord would deliver upon his promise and his plan in their life. God had a plan for Joseph. Uh, he was to be the ruler one day over his own brothers. But his brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. And so while he is in prison now, Joseph has to exercise faith in the Lord. Now think about David. God made a plan with David and said, David, I'm going to make you the king over Israel. But the issue at that time is that Saul was the king over Israel, and David wasn't the next in line. Saul all of a sudden becomes extremely jealous of David, and what does he want to do? He wants to kill David. So for years, he's chasing David throughout the desert in the wilderness, trying to stamp him out. That entire time, what did David have to do? He had to have faith in the Lord. And then you think about uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the Lord in the Old Testament. And God put it upon his heart to return to Jerusalem and actually build the walls around Jerusalem. That required a great amount of faith and trust in the Lord to open up those doors that he could walk through and accomplish what God had put upon his heart. So every single plan which God gives in the Old as well as the New Testament requires absolute trust in God the Father. You think about Jesus which is what we'll look at this morning. Jesus had a plan from his Father God. That plan was to come to this earth and to actually be the redeemer of the world. So Jesus was sent to be the Messiah. That was his plan. That was the journey that he was to take. And uh, we're going to see some realities about his journey this morning, which apply also to the realities of our journey with the Lord together. So y'all ready for it? Say yes. All right, let's go ahead and uh, look together in our Bibles. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. If you'll stand with me in honor of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible, we've got it here for you on the screens. And the Bible says, And it happened that Jesus was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. Now, very quickly, just look at me for a second. If you were uh, second century uh, individuals, and I read that verse to you, you know how you'd respond when I told you that Jesus was dining with tax collectors and sinners? Here's what you'd have done. You'd go, <gasps> that's what you'd have done. All right, so we're going to do that. I'm going to read it again. Y'all with me on this one? Now, 8 o'clock was down with this, so y'all can either make me look real foolish or this is going to be awesome. All right, so here we go. Let me read it again. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. That was a little much. No, I'm just kidding. That was great, man. For there were many of them, and they were following him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And, <laughs> and hearing this, Jesus said to them, and I love this statement, so listen closely. It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, I came to call the sinners. Let's bow together. Father, we do thank you for your divine, holy, inspired word. We ask that you would plant it in our hearts and it would bear spiritual fruit. God, I pray for those who have not yet got into the faith journey. That is, they don't know you personally. God, draw them this morning. Uh, some of them here today are going to try real hard not to listen. So, Lord, I just pray that you would just, I mean, boom from heaven the truth about who you are, that they might be saved. And, God, we pray for those who are disciples, those of us who are seeking to live a resolved life, following Jesus. Help us to glean some great insight from your divine word today, and we'll give you glory for it. And that's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. So you go ahead and be seated this morning, if you will. So three major realities. I'm going to drop them on you very quickly. I want you to jot them down, though. I believe these are going to really be a help to you as you are journeying in your faith towards heaven. All right, so first of all is this. You have to do what God has planned for you to do. You, you have to do what God has planned for you to do. Now, some of you are like, no, you don't. I, I know you don't. But what I'm trying to say is, you're going to miss out if you don't do what God has planned 
for you to do? Which begs the question, doesn't it? So if I was just sitting with you one-on-one, I would ask you, what has God planned for your life? I mean, God redeemed you. He brought you into the family. You now are walking with him. What is God's purpose for your life right now? Now, often I get several uh, responses to a question like that. One would be, I don't know. I just don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now with my life. So what I would do is encourage you in this way. I would say, sit down with the Lord, uh, sit down with your Bible, and pray. And ask the Lord, Lord, what exactly do you desire to do with me and through me in my life? And uh, I, I believe God answers the prayers of those who are genuinely seeking his purpose for their life. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, ask, seek, and knock. In other words, go after it. Seek the Lord. Seek his plan and his purpose for your life right now. And so I'd encourage you to do that if you're responding and saying, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So pray and listen. But then secondly, some people say, well, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I've just not really done it yet. In other words, God made it clear. God put a passion upon my heart. God called me to this specific uh, step in my life. And I know that if I go in that way, man, if he doesn't show up, then everything is going to fall apart. And so now you're in that particular mode in your thinking. And uh, sometimes it causes you to be paralyzed. You know what it is. You know you got to go in that direction. But fear begins to set in. And you begin to question and begin to think about what would actually happen if you made that decision. If you went in that particular direction. Sometimes all of a sudden you begin to realize that you might have to lay down a few things to follow the Lord's call upon your life. You might have to lay down pride, right? So in other words, sometimes you're thinking about going, but you say, if I do it, you know, what, what is my family going to say about me? What are my friends going to say? What will people at church say? What will people where I work? So you have that pride issue. You've got to really get over. Pride will uh, keep you from doing what God's called you to do. And then sometimes it's just a sacrifice of your own time, a sacrifice maybe even financially. And for some reason, you have allowed those things to keep you from moving forward with God's call upon your life. So what I want to say to you this morning uh, as a pastor is if that is you, hey, take the step. All right? Do what the Lord's called you. You have to do it. If you don't, you are flat out going to miss what God has for you, and I don't want you to miss it. Now, we remember Jesus. We read about him, obviously, in our text this morning, and uh, we learned together that uh, Jesus has a plan that is given to him by God the Father. And in our text of Scripture, he is actually beginning to carry out that plan in his life. Now, how do we know that? We know it because of who he is hanging out with. The Bible says that his purpose is to come and seek and save that which is lost. And so who is he spending time with? He's hanging out with sinners, and he's hanging out with tax collectors. So he is obeying God the Father's call upon his life. Now, you and I who are disciples, are followers of Jesus, willing learners, willing followers. Jesus cleared a pathway, as it were, all the way to heaven. And whenever we begin to follow him, that means we are called to do some things that are uncomfortable. We are called to do some things that we may not feel is really our uh, forte. But we still obey the Lord, and we still do what God has called us to do, or again, we're going to miss out on the very reason that God brought us into his kingdom to begin with. So I would just say to you, you've got to do it, man. You've got to do what God's called you to do. If you don't know what it is, find out and then get after it. Now, here's the second uh, statement I want to give you. And this one here is uh, the one that I knew was going to be hard to preach. All right, so are y'all ready for it? Say yes. Uh, It's pretty awesome. Whenever you follow the Lord, uh, you are certain to face difficulty. Uh, You are certain to face difficulty. We see this clearly in the life of Jesus in verse 15. So look at it again in your Bibles. He says, And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. Now, you got to get the picture, right? It's pretty wild. Last uh, couple of weeks, you know, uh, Maddie, because she broke her leg, she's, you know, immobile, so she's been at the house. Well, I write sermons on Monday at the house. And I finished the sermon, this one here that I'm preaching now. And uh, she said, let me hear it. And so I began to uh, tell her what was going on in the passage. I read her the sermon. And she was like, you need to use some more colorful words. You need to really tell them what that party was like. And I'm like, you need to quit drinking that medicine. You've got some issues, girl. 
but, but this is it, right? She's hanging out. She. How about Jesus? You're with me. I'm thinking of Maddie now. Jesus is hanging out in this party, but he's surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. Now, uh, I've introduced to you who tax collectors are before, so let me very quickly just do it again. But tax collectors are those who were Jews who actually kind of turned their back on their own Jewish people, and they went into cohorts with the Roman government. And in doing this, they agreed that they would actually collect taxes from the Jewish people and bring it to the Roman government. So they were tax collectors. But the thing is, they not only took uh, what was owed to Rome, they also took more and padded their pockets. All right? So that's why these tax collectors were hated and actually vilified uh, by the Jews during that particular day. They couldn't stand them. But then secondly, there were the sinners. And I, I've always been interested in that category, right? But this category in the scripture really describes those who are uh, very blatantly living outside of the faith. These are people who are walking far from God, doing their own thing. But the amazing reality of this text is that Jesus has his mission from God the Father, is to seek and save that which is lost. So at the house now, who's hanging out with him? The very people that he is seeking to save. Those who are tax collectors and those who are sinners. Now the religious leaders of the day were not big fans of Jesus hanging out with these kind of people. In fact, they saw Jesus and said, well, if he's a rabbi, he sure does hang out with a messed up crowd. Matter of fact, their entire lives were involved in trying to disregard and disengage from anybody who was a tax collector or a sinner. They were so fearful of becoming unclean that they were avoiding those kinds of people like the plague. So they disengaged from them, but when Jesus showed up, he engaged with them. So he wanted to be near these kinds of people. So if you can kind of look in that scene for just a moment, through the front door, Jesus sitting at that party table with all of the sinners and tax collectors and the disciples as well, everybody chatting back and forth. The room is loud, it's electric, and the religious leaders peer in, and they cannot believe what they're seeing. They are internally disgusted over Jesus' choice of company. But then if you back that out even further and look at it from God the Father's perspective, he is well pleased. Because he sees that Jesus is doing exactly what he was called to do. Seek and save that which was lost. Now, he's going to find great difficulty in his life and ministry. And that's what I want to kind of elevate right now. So you, you all got to come in here for a second, all right? So you got to pay attention. This is pretty wild. So what I did is I realized in, in Mark's gospel, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he faced a the temptation. Then he went about his preaching ministry, his healing ministry. And as he was involved in this ministry, every single um, time he turned around, someone was opposing him. Someone was coming against him vehemently with anger, wanting to, to get rid of him. It's, in a, it's an amazing um, set of circumstances. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think uh, only two chapters out of the book of Mark do we not see direct opposition towards Jesus. Two chapters. And those chapters are narratives. In other words, those chapters are actually telling a story about what Jesus is doing. Feeding the 5,000 takes up a whole chapter. So what I did is I began to uh, get a pen and a sheet of paper and, and just reread Mark's gospel again. I wrote down every single place where I found it. Jesus was facing difficulty, uh, opposition in his life. And you can imagine, right? So, I mean, that's a lot of writing because, because it happens a whole lot in his life and ministry. And then what I did is after I finished doing that, is I said, okay, I, sure, there's some common categories that we can drop some of these issues down into, and, and we found them, all right? And uh, I've got seven of them for you. Now, you've got to jot these down, and that's a whole lot. Y'all with me? But I'm going to give these to you very quickly, and I want you to pay close attention, all right? So the first category is this. There were degrading statements made about Jesus, degrading statements. L listen to what somebody said about Jesus in Mark 2, 7. They said, he's blaspheming. They literally looked at Jesus and said, he is cursing the very name of God. So those were degrading statements. Mark chapter 3, 20 through 21, uh, Jesus' own family said, he's lost his senses. I like what one commentator said, uh, uh, he said that his family was saying that Jesus was an unbalanced religious fanatic. So his own family making degrading statements about him. And, uh, on trial in Mark chapter 14, we read about the chief priest who uh, tre 
kept trying to get Jesus in trouble, kept trying to get uh, people to stand up and say negative things about Jesus. And the amazing thing is that people were volunteering to do it, and they were just making up stories. And so they were ragging out the Lord Jesus Christ, degrading statements. Second category, demeaning questions. Demeaning questions. Uh, We see one of these in our focal passage this morning. You look at verse 16 again in your Bible. This is pretty huge. It says, when the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? They were asking a question to seek to devalue and demean the Lord Jesus Christ. They were putting him down. And this happens all throughout Mark's gospel. Chapter 2, verse 18, they questioned Jesus. said, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but yours don't? Chapter 2 and verse 24, they were like, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? When Jesus went to his own hometown in Mark chapter 6, the people disregarded him, uh, simply saying, isn't this the carpenter? I mean, isn't this uh, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters right here with us? Uh, What they were saying is, uh, who does this guy think he is coming in here acting like a rabbi and a messiah? And then in Mark 7, the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? In chapter 8 and verse 11, the Pharisees came out and began to argue with Jesus, seeking a sign from heaven. So they were like, show us a sign. We want to see a sign from heaven. Chapter 10 and verse 2, uh, some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began questioning him. Mark chapter 11, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the right? to do what you're doing. Mark chapter 12, some Sadducees tried to ask him some questions about the resurrection, all in order to trip him up. So there it is again, demeaning questions. The third category were determined observers. Uh, These were people who are watching Jesus like a hawk. They're looking for a place in Jesus' life and ministry where they can complain and gripe and accuse. Mark 3 and 2, they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. The fourth category, Y'all with me say yes? This gets wild. Destructive plans throughout Jesus' journey of obedience to God the Father. There were always these backroom meetings going on. People getting together, trying to discuss a way to get rid of Jesus. In fact, listen to some of them. Chapter 3 and verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against Jesus as to how they might destroy him. Chapter 11 and verse 18, the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy Jesus, for they were afraid of him. The whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. Chapter 12 and verse 13, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. Chapter 14 and verse 1, the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize Jesus by stealth and then kill him. Then in chapter 15 and verse 1, early in the morning, The chief priests and the elders and the scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So here again, you see destructive plans. And then the fifth category, demoralizing laughs. Demoralizing laughs. Uh, Jesus entered a house where a young girl had died. And there were mourners in that house. Back in that day, whenever somebody died, they would actually hire people to show up and mourn over the loss of that loved one. But when Jesus entered into the house and saw all these mourners, here's what he said. He said, hey, y'all chill out. Uh, The girl is only asleep. She's not dead. And the Bible says in that particular moment that literally those mourners began to laugh at Jesus. And then who can forget the incident in Mark 15, 17? They dressed Jesus up in purple. They twisted a crown of thorns together. They shoved it upon his head, and they began to acclaim him, saying, hell, king of the Jews. It was all in mockery. It was all in jest. It was all laughing. And then the sixth category, deserting friends. Jesus spent the majority of his ministry with 12 disciples who were extremely close to him. And we know Judas Iscariot, 14 and 10, the Bible says he went off to the chief priest in order to betray him. Chapter 14 and verse 43, Judas, one of the 12, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So Jesus' closest friend turns his back on him. And then the seventh category of difficulty that Jesus faced are dominating attacks. Dominating attacks. Chapter 12, verse 12, they were seeking to seize Jesus. Chapter 14, they condemned him, deserving death. They began to spit on him. They blindfolded Jesus. They beat him. 
They yelled after they would hit him, prophesy, who just hit you? Chapter 15, they kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on his face and kneeling down before him. And while on the cross, even in chapter 15, it was still being attacked. Those who were passing by were hurling abuses at him. They were saying, hey, Jesus, you said you were going to tear down the temple and raise it again in three days. Why don't you just save yourself? And they mocked him. And they attacked him. It's amazing when you think about this. And this is what I want you to get, all right? So come with me here. Uh, God gave Jesus a plan. Jesus followed that plan. Now, here's the amazing thing of what a lot of us think. We think that whenever we obey God's plan for our life, that everything just is smooth sailing. That is the exact opposite of what we find in the Scripture. And some people are like, well, I started following the Lord, but man, I want to tell you, that door just didn't fling open, so I, I, I didn't see it was easy, so I didn't keep going. Th that's, you're not promised easy. I'm not promised easy. And Jesus began to go. And it's amazing, because if you think about the sufferings of Jesus, or if you're like me, typically my mind goes to the last week of Jesus' life. But that's not the only time he suffered. He suffered the entire time he was in ministry. Difficulty hitting him at every single turn. And the amazing thing is that the people who were coming against him, check this out, were his family, his friends, and the religious people. Jesus' major problem wasn't with the tax collectors and sinners. It was with his family, his friends, and religious people. Now, that being said, I wanted to kind of do this with you this morning. Because whenever I began to study this, what came to my mind uh, really was uh, to personify each one of these attacks that Jesus faced. So if you think about it, uh, whenever you seek to follow the Lord, you're going to face some of the same exact kind of attacks which Jesus faced. You're going to face some demoralizing laughs. Somebody's going to laugh at you. Somebody's going to make fun of you. They're gonna write. So if you said, I'm, I'm going to live for Jesus at the workplace, and you started doing that, guess what? Some people are going to rag you out. I, I remember as well uh, following Jesus and oftentimes have actually had people laugh and carry on and make fun. It's pretty amazing. You're also going to face degrading statements. When I was around 16, I knew God was calling me to preach. And so I surrendered to that. My family started telling my extended family that uh, Levi's going to be a preacher. And I remember uh, somebody in my extended family literally uh, making some degrading statements towards me. And to even say, oh, you're still young. You've got plenty of time to change your mind. Just ragging. Y'all with me say yes? And then there have been times, uh, maybe in your life, I know it's hit me before, that uh, you're seeking to be obedient to the Lord and you're facing demeaning questions. Somebody comes up and they start questioning you about what you're doing. I remember when um, the Lord uh, put it on my heart to step out of the pastor for a season and actually go and set up some training schools overseas that people were asking demeaning questions, right? So they were coming up and be like, Levi, you, you're married and you got four kids. How are you going to make a living? Have you even thought about that? What's wrong with you? And I was like, no, I haven't thought about that. It's probably a good question. And then determined observers. How about this? A wife gives her heart to Jesus in our faith family, but her husband's lost. And she goes home, and what does her husband do now after he finds out that she has given her heart to Christ? He says, I'm going to watch you like a hawk. And every single time she even remotely slips up, what does he do? He attacks her. Thought you were a Christian. Is that how they teach you to act down there at Concord? Maybe even uh, destructive plans, backroom conversations, I'm trying to get rid of you, I'm trying to stamp you out. I've got a friend in ministry who's facing this now. He loves Jesus, he preaches the word, but he's got some hellions to go to church where he pastors. Y'all all right for me to say that? I just did. So, what are they doing? They're trying to get people to show up at their house having these little meetings, trying to find ways that they can accuse my friend and get him tossed and fired. Which, by the way, that wasn't the only pastor that's experienced that at that church. 
dominating attacks. Somebody comes against you because of your faith, because you're trying to be obedient to the Lord. And I've hit that a few times. I do remember nothing like Jesus by any stretch, but I remember preaching overseas and being uh, mocked and ridiculed and hollered at deserting friends that's happened in my life all because i sought to do what jesus called me to do so i I remember man this has happened where i step out and i'm moving that direction and people turn their back all of a sudden now they want nothing to do with me now when you follow the lord you have to know that if you're being obedient to Christ, you're going to face this kind of difficulty. It's just going to come. And the amazing thing to me was to consider Jesus' life and ministry. He's baptized, he's tempted, and then he gets up and he begins to go about his ministry. And every single place that he goes, this is what's following. Everywhere. Everywhere he goes. It's hitting him. Matter of fact, in my sanctified imagination, I kind of pictured these as people. All of these attacks. And Jesus standing in the middle and the attacks just surrounding him. And it gets darker and it gets darker and it gets darker. And this is some of you may have experienced that. You may be experiencing that. And you're like, I'm seeking to do what the Lord's called me to do. But now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this is what's happening. Here's the difficulty that's coming. It gets dark. And you're like, all right, now what, what's going on? And uh, you're in good company if you feel that way. Jesus faced all of these. Which leads me to my third statement. you got to get this one, all right? I'm closing this one down with this because I love it. Don't let difficulty keep you from pressing on with God's call for your life. Don't let difficulty keep you from pressing on with God's call for your life. Look at verse 17, if you will, very quickly. The Bible says, And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. So what does Jesus do in this text? It's pretty awesome. Jesus actually reminds everybody who is present God's plan for his life. I came to seek and save those who are lost. And those who are spiritually sick, like the tax collectors and sinners, were the ones Jesus came to save. And the major problem with the religious people is that they believed they were already righteous enough because of their good deeds. Uh, They were self-medicating with religious activity and didn't see a need for the great physician in their lives. And in the face of difficulty posed, Jesus, I love it, Jesus did not allow it to keep him from God's plan for his life. Seek and save that which was lost. Now, y'all coming? So whenever you're seeking to do what the Lord's called you to do, I'm going to tell you what's happened to me, all right? So whenever I'm seeking to do what the Lord's called me to do, and this begins to kind of surround me, There are typically about three ways that I respond. One way is just flat out fear. I get scared. So I'm scared to death. It's like if I do this, what are people going to say? What are they going to think? If I go in that direction, what if we lose everything? Right? So I I get scared. Uh, Then I'm also tempted sometimes to uh, doubt the Lord. So it's in times like this when I'm surrounded, I'm like, Lord, did you call me to do this? Is this what you wanted me to do? Is this the direction you had for my life? I start to doubt him. And I love what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said one time. He said it like this, never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. But there are times, man, it's just doubt, it's just doubt. And then there are also times, and I I hate to tell you this, but this is just true. There are times I'm just like, I'll just quit. So it gets kind of rough, it gets kind of difficult, and uh, sometimes that's it. It's just like, I'll just just quit, man, I'll do something else. And the reason I share that with you is because, man, I don't want you to doubt. I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to fear. When this right here begins to encircle you, let it remind you that you need to look up. And be reminded about what God has actually purposed in your life to do and called you to do. Or you're going to miss it, every single bit of it. Which leads me to the final resolve, or rather the resolve for this morning. That's resolution number 10 for a disciple. And it's this, resolve to press on with God's calling regardless of the negative opinions of others. 
Resolve to press on with God's calling regardless of the negative opinions of others. So whenever you're following the Lord, do not give up. Could you imagine what would have happened if Noah would have given up? Or Joseph would have given up? Or what about this? And what if Jesus would have just said, I quit. I'm just going to go on back to heaven. Right? It would all been a mess. So what's going to happen if you give up? No. Let's bow together. Father, in Jesus' name, we do thank you for our time. And the opportunity, once again, just to uh, preach from your word is a, a great privilege. And I pray for all of those who are present this morning. And just ask that you would speak to their hearts. That you would stir up again maybe dreams that have been lost or tossed to the side or forgotten. That you bring them back to the forefront of individuals' minds. That they would obey you. That they would do what you have called them to do. God will trust you. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Listen, for some of you here this morning, you... you